Okay, uh, hello students and welcome to, um, I think this is our second uh, eschatology lecture. Um, we're going to do one thing uh, today in this lecture. Uh, we're just going to have a brief discussion about some of the essential elements that really the nature of the parousia. I'll define that term if that term is new uh, to you, uh, but we're just going to focus on that one thing uh, for this lecture. Because really, when you look at Christian eschatology, um, that is uh, that is the is essential word that is used to refer to uh, almost all of the elements of what you would say is is Christian eschatology. So, parousia um, is a term that we use to refer to the second coming of Jesus and all the events that, that surround or that are a part of that coming. So the event which has come to sort of define the parousia is Jesus' second coming, but that term parousia refers to all of the events, and it comes from uh, a Greek word, um, peri me or peri my, um, which means either to be present or arrival. And so typically... Uh, we translate that as presence. So parousia um, became a word that Christians started using very early on to reflect hope in Jesus's uh, hope in Jesus's presence at his second coming. So then uh, theologically, um, and this is sort of inside baseball for for Christians, particularly for for us in this class is, <clears throat> or the classes that you'll take here at Elam, um, theologically, uh, the parousia is at the intersection of the systematic theological category of Christology and the systematic theological category of eschatology, because you can't have a discussion of the person and work of Jesus without discussing his second coming. So that would be Christology, and you can't discuss the final events in human history without a discussion of, again, Jesus's second coming. So that would be eschatology. Interestingly enough, um, when you think about what the entire Bible has to say about either Jesus's first coming or second coming, is that is that the second coming, the, the reappearing of Jesus, is mentioned or alluded to um, about 300 times in the New Testament. And that is really, that's eight times more than any reference to his first coming. And so in relation to that, believers are urged over 50 times in the New Testament to be ready. Some aspect of that, be prepared, be ready um, for Jesus' second coming. And so the second coming of Jesus is, is often discussed not just in relationship to um, the events surrounding Jesus' second coming, but uh, the New Testament also provides specific motivation for the here and now based on Jesus' second coming. And here are just a few of those references. So 1 Thessalonians 3, um, Paul tells uh, the Thessalonians to increase and abound in love for one another, and he does that. Uh, in the context of the second coming. So, so in this specific passage, Paul would be using the parousia to motivate the Thessalonians to brotherly love. He does the same thing uh, to the Roman church in Romans uh, 13, verses 12 through 14, where he motivates them to holiness uh, as a result of, of the second coming. Um, the writer of Hebrews um, where it says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together in Hebrews chapter 10 ends that discourse with, as you see the day drawing near. So the writer of Hebrews is using um, Christian hope in the parousia to establish the need for Christians to regularly meet together. Paul tells Timothy uh, to remain faithful in Christian service, and he does that in the context of the parousia. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, again, um, which if you haven't figured it out, 1 Thessalonians is 
if nothing else, eschatological. Um, but in First Thessalonians uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he tells the Thessalonian church to maintain their passion for lost souls. And in perhaps uh, the passage that most of us are familiar with, I'm just going to read it here from the ESV, um, from uh, 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul is, is using a discussion of end time events, of the parousia, to, to give comfort in times of bereavement. So 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 14 through uh, 18, Paul writes, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep or died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So it's not unusual at a Christian funeral, particularly when it is a Christian um, who has passed away for whomever is leading the funeral service to allude to or directly quote uh, that passage, because we have hope that we will see our loved ones again in the parousia. So I just want to say a, a quick note um, about the parousia, um, there is a Jewish understanding of the parousia. So the, the events and the idea that there will that the end of human existence, the righteous will be vindicated. That's really rooted in in Jewish eschatology. Uh, Paul often used the term "day of the Lord" um, in his writings, and that is an Old Testament term that is a Jewish term found in Amos 5.18, Isaiah 2, 6 through 22, and Zechariah 14, 3 through 5. But the primary difference, now, when you look at Jewish eschatology, thinking about the end of things, the parousia, both of those ideas are rooted in the Messiah. The Jewish idea or Jewish eschatology is predicated on theophanies. Now, when you see the word theophany, um, the best definition I can get of theophany is a physical manifestation of God, a miracle. The burning bush was a theophany. Jesus walking on water was a theophany. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead was a theophany. Um, so, so miracles. So a Jewish understanding of eschatology is really predicated on theophanies after the coming of the Messiah. So from a Jewish eschatological perspective, Messiah comes, Messiah performs miracles, and Messiah establishes Jewish reign on earth where the Jews are vindicated and the unrighteous are punished. But the Christian understanding, if you haven't already figured that out, is, is based on both the first and the second coming. So, so a Christian understanding of eschatology begins with the incarnation. And we talked about this a little bit in the last lecture. So the last days begin at the incarnation, begin when the Messiah comes. But the idea of the, uh, the full establishment of God's kingdom, where the righteous are vindicated and the unrighteous are, pun unrighteous are punished, is something that is yet to come. It is something that will happen at the Messiah's second coming. So Jewish understanding really is more about a Messiah's first coming, whereas a Christian understanding would be first and second. And that makes perfect sense when you think about the fact that the Jews are still awaiting the Messiah. They rejected Jesus as a Messiah. So, so that's really all I wanted to say about that. I just want to make sure that you know that, that there is a Jewish understanding of the parousia, Um that differs significantly from a Christian understanding of the parousia, but they are both founded in an, an understanding of the Messiah, uh, an understanding of the vindication of the righteous, and an understanding of 
the punishment of the wicked. So now the, the reason we're having this lecture, um, I wanted to talk about the nature of the parousia. This is just a few essential elements um, that I think are helpful to our understanding of, of the parousia. So for Christians, the parousia, the, the second coming of Jesus, is a literal historical event where Jesus, the, the Jesus of the New Testament, will return to earth. Now, there are variant beliefs in Christianity on the timing of, of those events and maybe even exactly how those events will play out. But the, the fact that, that Jesus will return, that there are a, a plethora of events at the end of human history that is marked by the highlight of which is Jesus' second coming is an orthodox Christian value. It's an orthodox Christian belief. Um, and there is some obviously some, some differences there in, into how we interpret those. And, and I'm sure that you're aware of some of those. And we're going to explore some of those in this class through your reading and, and through some of the lectures. But, but that's what Christians have believed since the beginning, since, since Jesus ascended. That's what Christians have believed, that Jesus would come again. So what do we believe? What are some essential elements of the parousia? Well, first of all, Jesus' second return is personal. Um, I just want to read a passage to you from John, John uh, 14, 2 through 3. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to emphasize some words when I read it again. So I'm just going to read it the first time. John 14, 2 through 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So the, the second coming of Jesus is personal. I'm going to read that again. Jesus said, I go to, pre go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. It's very personal. Um, and what joy we have in that, that that is a, that is a personal message to, to each Christian, which I think is, is incredibly helpful to understanding uh, the circumstances surrounding those events. So it's a personal return. It, it's also a personal return in that Jesus will be the one that returns. He will personally return. In Acts 1.11, after Jesus ascends into heaven, the angels appeared and they said, this same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way, right? So Jesus will come back in the same way. It'll be Jesus that comes back. And so while Modern approaches to eschatology sometimes really focus, focus on the corporate nature of the parousia, the, the second coming. Um, that's not an incorrect view, but I do think it's important that we highlight that Jesus' words were very personal. His second coming is very personal. Every Christian should be aware that regarding Jesus' second coming, he is returning for you. Not just us, you your face and your name, who you are, Jesus is coming back for you. That union with Jesus will be very personal. So it's personal. Uh, the second aspect that I want to make sure that we understand is that Jesus' return will be visible, not mysterious, not hidden. There's no, uh, at least as far as we can tell in the New Testament, it's, it's very clear that, that when Jesus returns, it won't be a mystery. His first coming wasn't a mystery. Now, it's interesting to note that his first coming was not exactly what the Jews thought it would be. It, it was, but they were they had developed religious traditions that had, to some extent, amended uh, 
the circumstances around the coming of the Messiah to the extent that they missed it. I think it's important that you note that, that religious traditions had developed that caused them to miss the Messiah. And that's not to say that we don't have religious traditions that um, impact our understanding of the parousia. But when it comes to Jesus's second coming, I think it's very clear that it will not be, it will be visible and it will not be mysterious or hidden. In that same passage we just read in Acts 111, Angel made it clear that, that Christians would see Jesus' return in the same way you've seen him ascend into heaven. He will come again. The believers saw Jesus ascend with their own eyes, and believers will see him when he comes again. Uh, according to Revelation 1.7, um, the second coming will not be an event that only Christians see. Um, this verse states, look, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So not only will it be personal, but it will be a visible event, um, visible to both believers and unbelievers. Now, what about the timing of Jesus' second coming? Um, it's important to note that, that apostles and the early Christians fully expected Jesus to return in their lifetime. Um, Paul reflects this in his writings, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. He says, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We who start who are still alive. So, so the first generation of Christians fully expected that the thing the angels told them at the ascension would happen in their lifetime. So the imminent return of Jesus was something they believed and they were expected to conduct both their lives and their ministries according to this potential immediate event. So they believed it was immediate, but they also understood that there might be a generation, uh, that their generation uh, might very well be dead whenever uh, Jesus finally returns. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.14 that by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us up also, meaning that, that us also, meaning that Paul knew that although he expected it to be imminent, there was, uh, there was this reality that that generation may die and may be of those who are dead and are raised in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.10 says he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. So the timing of Jesus' second coming has always consisted of two elements. When I say always, from the beginning uh, of the church, from that moment when Jesus ascends into heaven and the angels say he's coming back the way he just left, the, the Christian church has, has viewed the second coming two ways. Number one, it's an imminent event. The writers of the New Testament very clearly had this idea that it was an imminent, imminent event. Christians believed that Jesus would return at any moment, and the writings, the liturgies, or songs reflected hope in that immediacy. Peter urged his readers in 2 Peter 3.11 to look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So it was, it was an imminent event, but they also understood that it was a future event. All Christians, including Paul, were aware that of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So the parousia is both an imminent event, meaning that Christians have always believed that at any moment, Jesus could return. But they've always underst also understood that it's a future event, meaning that we are ready for Jesus to come imminently, but we are preparing for Jesus to come in the future. So how should Christians then respond to this paradox? So there's nothing in the New Testament. If, if the, and there have been groups through Christian history that have 
pulled away from the world and conducted themselves communally in a way that says, we're just going to wait right here for Jesus. We're just going to pull ourselves away from the world and we're going to await the parousia right here. There's nothing in the New Testament that suggests Christians should piously await Jesus's second coming by cutting themselves off from the world and just biding their time until he comes. The opposite is true. We know from the Gospels that Jesus expects his followers to engage the culture that they're in until he returns, to engage in ministerial activity until he calls the church home. And the two aspects, and uh, you know, I'll say this in, in a lot of lectures, but the two aspects that Jesus expects his followers to engage in until the moment he returns is number one, making disciples, not just converts, not just preaching the gospel and having people accept Jesus, but discipling people who disciple people. So the, the, the ministry of discipleship is expected to, to be a chief aim of the church until he returns. And then I would say the second would be ministry to the needy. Now, in the last lecture, I covered what I mean by ministry to the needy. But if, but if you need a refresher, just read that passage in Matthew 25, where, where Jesus separates the goat from the sheep, uh, the, the goats from the sheep. And uh, that separation is based on how they responded to needy people, uh, the naked, the hungry, uh, the, the prisoners, uh, the sick, so on and so forth. So, so those two activities are not to cease until Jesus calls the excuse me calls the church home. And so, this idea that we're just going to huddle up in our corner of the world, we're going to uh, buy some property and build a fence and just kind of stay uh, separate from the world is not a is not a New Testament idea. It's not, I, I can't find it anywhere in the New Testament. It, I would say that more than just being a bad interpretation, I would say that that sort of approach to being a Christian is antithetical to what Jesus taught in the gospel. And so uh, let you take that for what it is. So that's, that's it. We're just, that's all we wanted to do in this lecture. Um, as you read uh, uh, through this section on eschatology and as I give lectures, you're going to hear the term parousia. Um, and the purpose of this lecture was so that you would be comfortable with it. You would understand the context of it um, in many places in theological literature where you uh, see the word parousia. You could, if you wanted to, you could substitute second coming. It's bigger than that, but that's essentially uh, the events surrounding the second coming. Um, you might also see the term eschaton. That refers to that same thing. It's just three different ways to, to sort of capture uh, the, the, same, the same event. But the highlight of the eschaton and the parousia is the coming of Jesus, second coming of Jesus, where Paul writes about in 1 Thessalonians, where every eye will see, where Every, every person on earth will witness the second coming of Jesus, um, particularly Christians, right? It's for Christians, but even those who are not Christians uh, will, will see that event. Um, it's an event that, that will not be hidden or mysterious. Um, to the best of our knowledge that we can tell from the New Testament, Jesus is not going to come back um, in the shadows and then reveal himself to key people first. It'll be a global event. So I hope you have a better understanding of parousia as we move forward uh, this semester. Uh, thanks for attending the lecture. And as always, if you have questions about this lecture or any of your assignments, please uh, send me an email or text me and I'll see you next time.